according to the police officer I spoke to. They went through a list of questions in order to ascertain whether or not she was safe and determined that she was okay to be on her own on the streets of Victoria, barefoot in November, and they left her there. That was the last time anyone ever saw her. You are listening to Emma Filipoff is Missing, a series by the Nighttime Podcast. Unlike any other story I've covered, the unexplained disappearance of Emma Filipoff has stuck with me. I've tried to figure out what about this case resonates so strongly with me, but the best I can do is narrow it down a bit. I'm sure it's in part due to the mystifying details of her last known day. It likely involves some lingering emotion left over from speaking to her mother Shelley, but perhaps most of all, I think it's that I simply believe that Emma's case is close to being solved. I suppose things just haven't lined up tight enough to make it happen. At least not yet. As we heard Emma's mother Shelley describe in our last episode, some interesting leads have surfaced during the search, like the green shirt guy, the countless unconfirmed sightings, and of course the suspicions that have been swirling around her one-time friend Julian. But despite great effort in the airing of CBC's Finding Emma documentary, there's been next to nothing in the way of development since then. But as they always seem to, an unexpected development just made things much more interesting. This episode, just as its title suggests, was originally to feature a conversation in which my friends Tim and Lance of the Missing Maura Murray podcast and I dig deeper into the many elements of Emma's disappearance. But in early March 2016, news broke that completely derailed any conversations about Emma Filipoff's case. The press would learn that Emma's mother and our past guest, Shelley Filipoff, as well as Emma's brother, Matthew, had been charged with a series of offenses related to cocaine trafficking, money laundering, and illegal firearm possession. We will still dig deeper into Emma's case as planned shortly, but before we get to that, I've invited Shelley back to address the charges against her, and thankfully she was willing to join me and explain why this personal matter is not relevant to Emma's disappearance. After my interview with Shelley, we will get to our regularly programmed discussions. I'll get started now with my follow-up interview with Shelley Filipoff. So b- before we get into the to, to those items that I wanted to discuss, I just wanted to ask, first of all, if there's been any new developments in the search for Emma since we last spoke. Unfortunately, no, there there has been nothing new. We still we still get tips. We still get sightings. Unfortunately, occasionally um, the tip or the, the tip that we'll get will say, I think I might have seen your daughter in uh, Edmonton in 2015. Well, that may be or may not be, but that's of no use. If we, don't, if we can't respond to the tip immediately, then that tip isn't really much use to us. And because I'm in Ontario, um, if someone feels that they have seen Emma, they need to get a hold of the local police ASAP and get them to uh, look into it. Because, again, I'm in Ontario. I can't just be in Edmonton, you know, in a split second or in Vancouver or wherever the sighting's been. So it's very important that people realize that. Uh, Even though people mean well, and and it's not a lack of appreciation on my part by any means, but it doesn't really help us narrow down where she might be. One reason that the story's been in the news recently, and I have to bring this up, it's an unexpected reason that I'll have to address, and that reason being the criminal allegations against yourself and another Filipov family member. Now, given that these charges are still pending, can you comment on your current legal situation as well as how this situation's impacting your search for Emma? Uh, yes, I can. I, there are two or three uh, points that I would like to make. Uh, the first uh, point that I would like to make are the charges. Um, nothing, nothing's moved ahead. Um, my lawyer still does not have disclosure, so we have no idea what the uh, legal community thinks they have against me. And I will tell you, I will be very frank uh, with uh, what took place. Uh, my son, my older son, Matthew, who's 28, 
um, had been using my house as a stash house for uh, cocaine. And I was unaware of it, and the police apparently had been tracking him for some time. And um, because it's my house, but not his address, they felt that I must in some way be involved, therefore charged me. I uh, was in no way aware of what Matthew was doing. It uh, goes without saying that Matthew didn't announce to me, his mother, what he was up to. And one of the points that people have, have, have made and uh, have said, well, how could you not know what's going on in your house? Well, Matthew, my children come and go as they please from my home. Um, I would would not suspect Matthew of such an activity, therefore I wouldn't be monitoring his behavior while he was uh, visiting. And the other thing is, as well, in my emotional state, I spent a lot of time in my own world, so um, I would, wouldn't have been tracking his comings and goings. Um, so it is my hope that um, all charges will be dropped, as none of them are... Um, are applicable, and that's that's what I'm waiting for is to hear from the court system. Um, the second point I would like to make, and the most salient one, is that I was um, very hurt. I was angered, uh, very upset over the fact that uh, a number of people, not people that know me, anyone that knows me has been extremely supportive. I have an extremely supportive community. People that know me know that these are false accusations, but a number of people chose Emma's Facebook page to attack me, um, to make negative comments in regards to uh, to the charges against me. That page is intended for Emma and Emma only. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, so that is the most salient point that I would like to make. Um, it was very, it was very hurtful. It was very hurtful. Um, and then you know how how Facebook goes, and then people respond and. And then there would be a debate about whether the charges could be real. Maybe this is why Emma is actually missing. And it just went on and on. And uh, I chose not to delete them because I really do believe in free speech. But I also chose not to comment. I have chosen not to comment on any of these. Uh, needless to say, now they've subsided. It seems that the interest has, has shifted away from me. And, and how has this all gotten in the way of your, of your search for Emma? I'm just assuming that... If, if you're going to do interviews or meet with anybody, this is going to be coming up. How, do, how are you dealing with that? Um, it, it upsets me that the focus will turn to that um, because I am me, and that's an incident that is completely separate from my daughter's case. Emma is missing. Emma is lost. My activities, whether true or not, um, have absolutely no bearing on the case. And people get lost, much less so now. Now the, the interest has waned, but people were getting lost in my case as opposed to continuing to focus on on Emma. So that has been difficult. And as I said, a number of people used Emma's page to vent and to attack me and do a little character assassination and that kind of thing. So that's been difficult to deal with. Not only the the hurtful comments, but the fact that they're taking time and space from Emma's page, mm -hmm. which is intended to help me find Emma, not have people come after me. I can't even imagine how that must all feel. And I know the type of comments you're, you're mentioning, because when this all happened, that was one of the first places I went to to find out what was going on. And I, so I know exactly what you're referring to. So for, from there, I'll, I'll change the topic unless there's anything else you, you want to say about that. Uh, no, again, no, just uh, I would like the cases to be considered separately as one has nothing to do with the other. Unfortunately, now when you Google Emma Philippoff, um, very quickly one of the things that comes up is, is mother of missing woman Emma Philippoff charged with blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's taking away from what's the most important thing. And the most important thing is that we find Emma. As I've said on my social media accounts, I support and stand by Shelley Filipoff during this legal process. I don't know enough about what happened or what will happen to have a strong opinion, 
but I do know that Shelley's been upfront and open with me, despite gaining nothing in return aside from a venue to share her daughter's story. Now, regardless of what did or didn't happen, in what role Shelley may or may not have played in the crime she's accused of being involved in, I don't see any connection between Emma's disappearance and this situation which is playing out four years later. Of course, I'll be watching this closely and will provide an update on Shelley's legal fight in an upcoming episode of this series. So for now, let's leave it at that and move on to the main content of this episode. Our next guests, Tim and Lance, are well known for their coverage of a high-profile American missing persons case on their groundbreaking podcast, Missing Maura Murray. After running in the same podcast circles for several years and collaborating on a live event in Boston, Tim, Lance, and I had become good friends in life and trusted colleagues in podcasting. Given their experience covering a missing persons case so effectively on their show, I invited Tim and Lance to review Emma's case and then join me in digging deeper via a conversation. What you'll hear next was recorded shortly after they finished listening to the first episode of this series and watching CBC's documentary, Finding Emma. Before I invited you both to talk to me about the case, were you aware of Emma Filipov's disappearance? I was not. I learned of her disappearance through your show after you had contacted us the first time. I went back and listened to all of them, and that was obviously the second one that you did. Yeah, I wasn't aware of the uh, disappearance either. And um, When I read the name, at first I thought I might have been. And in the back of my head, I, I remember thinking, oh, that one. And then uh, I was trying really hard when I was looking at the pictures to uh, make the connection. But no, I was not familiar with that case. In Canada, this is a, a pretty major case, mainly because CBC did a, a documentary on it, Finding Emma. And what's funny, when I first heard about, about your show, immediately where my head went was like, wow, that Maura Murray's case sounds so much like Emma Philippos. I'll have to check out the show. So it's just it's funny how that works. They definitely are similar cases for a lot of reasons. Uh, I said that a lot, kind of listening. It was like, this is the Canadian Mora, and obviously I know the Mora story first and better. So, yeah, that was where my head went immediately. Well, I uh, just uh, not doing this to cause any um, scripted drama or st- scripted uh, conflict, but that was the first thing that I thought. And then the more I looked into it and... Um, and when I watched the Fifth Estate's production of Finding Emma, it was like Mora. And the more I started watching it, the more it really started to deviate from anything that I related to Maura Murray. The, the main things that I've, I found similar between the two was, for one, and maybe Emma's case painted my perception of Mora's, but the elements of, of mental health and mental, mental illness when I listen to, to your show and, and read about Morris case, I'm often thinking, could she possibly have been suffering a mental illness? And could that explain her odd behavior in the days leading up to it? Um, that, that's one thing I, that I thought hadn't, they had in common. The other being the day Emma disappeared, she was, she was up to something. She was planning to either go somewhere or do something. Cause she had bought the, uh, a prepaid cell phone, prepaid credit card on the day she disappeared, just as Mora planned, you know, was planning something. So th- those are kind of the things I was looking at when I was thinking of the similarities. Those are pretty uh, similar circumstances. Uh, they were both planning on something. They both were planning on some sort of getaway, we'll, we'll say, a journey or whatever. But the mental illness part of it, I think, was way more obvious in the Emma case. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was watching the CBC documentary, I, I was starting to almost feel this really like guilty sense of jealousy that you have this diary that she's writing in and you have um, access to the surveillance, any sort of security video is already out there. This happened in 2012, right? Exactly. November of 2012. Yeah, you have access. All of the footage is out there. The family's cooperating. And the diary to me, and I guess I'm making two points at the same time here, the diary is what really struck me as uh, as uh, something that was um, suggesting some sort of something beyond an adolescent angst it was it was there was a there was some there was paranoia well she was an artist no question about that uh some of her poetry i thought was was really interesting and great even the one that uh has been referred to as a suicide note 
at first glance you say, oh yeah, that's a suicide note. Um, but I actually don't think it necessary. I, well, I actually don't think it is a suicide note. Um, even though she says this is coming from dead Emma, right? I just think she was consumed with creativity. And I know her dad was an artist. Um, the similarities with the Moore case are, are staggering because there are still three possible outcomes. Suicide, murder, or... Or kind of running away. With, with, with Emma's, there's, there's some thought that she may have left her life to live a transient life living on the streets somewhere, maybe as a result of her mental illness. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess. Her, her mom says she, she believes she was mentally ill. So I, I would start there and take her word for it absolutely that she was probably suffering from some kind of manic episode, some kind of uh, psychotic break. But at the same time, I don't think you can discount abduction or murder or, or runaway for that matter. Um, but that guy, Julian, I think really needs to be looked at more. And I know he was in the documentary, the Finding Emma documentary, uh, and, and he was very, very brave to do that interview. Um, but it's very, uh, very strange wording in his email to Emma's dad saying he used the word stock. No one else used the word stocked. It's fascinating to me. It, it Maybe it's a little bit too much like in the movies. Like we get this a lot. Like people people say, oh, John Smith, you guys got to watch him. He's he's like a Hannibal Lecter type. He gets close to you. And, you know, to say that Julian is that guy, he's putting himself out there. It's far fetched in general because the percentages of that are very, very slim. But that guy needs to be looked into more. But he was looked into and he passed a polygraph test, right? So was. No, 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 no. I, I agree. Yeah, exactly. Um, because I think even passing that polygraph test still isn't enough to convince me that it was just a coincidence he ended up in the same town as her. So many, how long was that after? I don't know exactly how long, but it was a short amount of time. I think months is what we're looking at. It doesn't, yeah, I guess it doesn't really matter because you're looking at an entire country where she could have gone. It's, I mean, it, it, it's pretty clear that... I mean, unless it is a giant coincidence, I don't know what you believe, but it's it's pretty clear to me that he somehow connected everything because he he ends up he ends up quote unquote randomly bumping into uh, Shelley later on and gets involved yeah. in the search, which to he me gets involved in the search. When I listened to that part, I didn't know that that happened. When I asked her the question in that conversation, that sent shivers down my spine. I was just like, that is really weird, right? When she's talking about how she's sitting there and she looks over and someone's staring at her, and she actually had to make the move to talk to him as opposed to him walking over to her and saying, "Are you Emma's mother?" And yet he recognized her out of the crowd. And he said he recognized her from yeah. Facebook photos. I think is what yeah. she had said. I mean, that's that's uh, that. And when I saw his uh, when I saw him on on camera, and he said, "Nope, that's an absolute coincidence." And everyone else is saying, "I don't believe in coincidences, especially when it's a, a especially when it's a missing person, a missing attractive female. Who do you always go to first? Yeah, the boyfriend or uh, boyfriend yeah. or the husband. Yeah." But I will say that coincidences are a thing. As looking into this Maura Murray case, we we experience coincidences maybe as bizarre as that, um, where we have experienced them. And so, so I I know that that's possible. Um, but he seems like I mean he called himself a stalker. Yeah. What are, what are the chances that the timing would be this tight? Because Shelley was arriving by plane three hours after she was last seen. Something was going on that day that led Emma to get the credit card, the cell phone. The police were called because she was standing on a busy intersection with her shoes in her hand in the middle of a cold November night. What are the chances that that would be the night that somebody abducts her or does something? It just Yeah, she'd be vulnerable that night, but it just yeah. seems weird that this much is going on and then lightning strikes. Then a random lightning strike. It does, but as we learned um, about victimology in our episode with Marley Davis, Emma was the perfect victim that night. The perfect victim. Shoeless, potentially going through a psychotic break at that moment. The way she behaved in the 7-Eleven, I don't think you can say for certain that she wasn't actually running from somebody based I on that video footage. I, I, I was thinking about this um, 
because that was that that, that was my first impression that she's uh, and and the one of uh, of her going in and out of the Y like six times. Yeah. Um, and it's like, oh, she's she's running from somebody. Now, unless there's something in her diary that law enforcement hasn't given to the family or made public, because it seems like they made a lot of that public, her diary public. There's no one specific mentioned in that. She wrote so so often in that diary, you'd think that there would be a mention of, for example, Julian won't leave me alone or something. Mm -hmm. But that's not out there. But yet we have these videos of her clearly looking out, like clearly looking out as if she's being followed or as if she's uh, being shadowed. Uh, chased or or stalked, and there's no mention of a name anywhere in these diaries that she so often writes in. So that's that's why I'm leading more towards either like a complete psychotic paranoid breakdown or or some sort of drug use. Emma was bursting with creativity, and so I I think that some of those diaries may have been about Julian, but not named him. Yeah, and it's all that writing. It's it's creative writing, journal, poetry, kind of all blended together. So they may as well have just been paintings that people are interpreting because it was mm -hmm. it, the, the wording and, and the language was so vague. Yeah. Now let's get to some of the main points um, Shelley made during the interview we had just listened to. First thing that, that has to come up at this point is the charges that Shelley's facing. Although she hasn't been proven guilty or anything, just the timing of this and the fact that this is dumped on top of her and her family in the middle of the search for her daughter. I, I don't know what to make of it. When, when you've heard that after, because Tim, you had known about my first episode. When you heard about these charges against Shelley, what were your thoughts? I think immediately you go to, oh, it's like, oh, no, I hope this I hope this isn't what it sounds like. You know, w could she have had something to do with Emma's disappearance? So your head does go there naturally, I think. Yeah. W when I first read the article, I was um, I was just like at work and my phone was just blowing up with messages and emails and stuff. And it was it was just as the news was announced. So people who had listened to my show were filling me in. And when I first read it, it sounded bad. But. After speaking to Shelly the first time, there is no doubt in my mind that she wasn't a grieving mother searching for her daughter. Um, the fact, to me, my first thought was if she was trying to, you know, if she, let's say she was involved and she was trying to hide it or something, why would she appear on the second episode of, an, of a completely unknown podcast to talk to me for an hour and a half? That was my first thought. But when I spoke to her this time and she gave her explanation of what happened to, with, with her son, you know, storing stuff in her basement and all that, to me, that absolutely makes sense. My parents had no idea what I was doing in their house. And I had a lot of things in my parents' house that if the police found it, we'd all would have been in some trouble. Uh, how old was her son? Uh, I, I, she didn't give me the age, but I believe it's Emma's older brother. So he was, he's probably in his 30s, I'm guessing. So it's a, it's a house I'm assuming he, he's very familiar with. And, you know, when you're when you're in when you're in that sort of situation, I am once again assuming that you you stash things in a familiar spot where, you know, familiar hiding spots. You know, you know, the you know, the places that you can open up. A, I'm just saying you can open up a floorboard. You can go into the attic and, you know, all the little like nooks that you can stash things in. Um, what do you have stored in your old family <clears throat> home, Lance? Well, let's not go there. Well, but I asked um, the question. <laughs> but. When I first uh, when I first heard of it, it was uh, I. It's funny, maybe it's because just being a part of uh, the 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 Moore Murray uh, disappearance, I just immediately went to Wow, this family has been pulled apart. This family has been, you know, they're they're they the yeah, this family has been pulled apart, and it really wasn't. I, it never once occurred to me that there was any connection between. Um, cause I know Shelly said that there was, uh, people were accusing, you know, this is why she went missing this is probably some drug trade. And I can only imagine and can't even begin to sympathize enough with her that, you know, the, the theories and the, you know, the yeah. scenarios that people come up with online and present to her, but it really is. It just, it seems like a broken family. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and it's just it's like it's heartbreaking. And this may, yeah. may be a symptom of the broken family. Like these are just the things that happen when something traumatic happens in the center Absolutely. of the family. When I, when I when I spoke to her, my thought both times after I got off the phone with her was just how can she possibly even talk about this, let alone you know lift her head off the pillow in the morning. I can't. Like, and Tim, you can probably relate to this. Is if something ever happened to my child. 
I don't know how I could go on for another second after, you know, it happened. Yeah, it would be it would be uh, really awful. Yeah, I I definitely believe uh, Shelley's story. No question about it. It sounds uh, way more likely than what uh, you know the f initial articles sounded like. So I, I'm happy to hear her on your uh, in your interview and uh, completely believe her and uh, sympathize with her. Mm -hmm. I just hope it gets settled quickly because I just like the, if she does if she didn't already have enough to worry about to have that dumped on top of it. It's just it's almost seems cruel. Yeah. And she I, is a really strong person, right? She came right out and she was you said, I don't know if we were if we're able to talk about this. And and she no, we can talk about it. We can talk about it because she wanted to put it out there. She wanted, it seemed to me that she wanted to put it out there and say, I have nothing to do with this. This is something that happens in a family and it's got nothing to do with Emma and, you know. Yeah. It, and I applaud her for not responding to the trolls that she mentioned on, on the Facebook page. She didn't respond at all to their points. And I think that's the best way to handle that. She, she really knocked that one out of the park. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the, the fact that she can talk, like talk about a strong person. She talks about it with composure like her voice isn't even wavering i couldn't imagine talking about anything that she speaks about on these calls and she's just she's direct she's not humming and hawing it's uh i find it incredible yeah she's amazing mm -hmm. right now the next thing i find odd is the police handling of emma's disappearance uh well not i guess not the police handling of her disappearance but the police handling of emma the the night they spoke to her now they they were responding to a call from uh, a guy that had known Emma just from meeting her a few times at the library. He phoned the police after running into her at the busy intersection without her shoes on on a cold November night. They they approached her, the police, and spoke about forty for about 45 minutes, ultimately in the end just leaving her on the side of the road where she's never seen again. Uh, the police uh, have never released the details of the transcript or the transcript of that conversation or the details of the conversation, but they did say that they were repeatedly assured by her that she was okay and not at a danger to herself. I guess hindsight's twenty twenty. She's she's now missing, and they spoke to her. But to me, if if I approach someone who's in a state of um, trauma or or having a breakdown on the side of the road, I. I don't know how I would deal with it, but I feel like I wouldn't just be saying, you know, are you okay? All right. I think it's pretty easy to write it off as if they had said, like, okay, see you later. But they probably have a list of things that they have to ask people when they're in that situation. And when I was listening to it again, my first response is, wow, why didn't the police take her to the sh take her to the uh, to the to the woman's shelter or take her to a, a safe, warm place? And then I realized the world we live in today. There are probably so many liabilities that police officers have. They're probably instructed, don't, don't, you you cannot take people from the street because no one can tell what happens in the police car between when you pick them up and, and to when you deliver them. And, and these are real things. Like these are things that police officers have to pay attention to. And maybe that, maybe it's simply that maybe the, maybe the police officers felt like shit having to leave her there. And, you know, maybe we'll swing by in an hour or a half hour and check on her. And, you know, maybe that was what they were thinking. But I think legally, I think liability wise, they might not have been in a position to I, I, I remember being I think I was like 22 or so. And then my car broke down and police officer pulled up and um, I said that I was I was going to, uh, you know, tr try to figure out what was wrong with it. And I, and I said, can you give me a ride to a phone? And, and he was like, can't do it. I'm not a taxi service. And he drove away. And, and I mean, that was a really quick, like easy, you know, getaway for him. But um, I was pissed at first. But when I think about it now, it's like well, you can't just pick up anybody who's. Yeah, but she was shoeless. It doesn't November. matter. It doesn't matter. It could yeah. be a trap. Like it's 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 actually liability. This, you know, the yeah. police state, the, the law enforcement might not. You, you, you could you maybe he could get a, could have gotten suspended for doing that. Even if it was all on the up and up. There's nothing illegal about being shoeless on the side of a road on a cold November night when you're alone uh, and acting strange. But I just feel like um, everything that happened that day leading up to her disappearance would show that she wasn't in her right mental state. And I can't imagine that they could speak to her for 45 minutes 
and something not happened that would lead them to say, you know, get in the car and we're going to have to make sure you're okay. It was a 45 minute conversation. Yeah. And they've, Oh, I missed that. And okay. Shelly's yeah. been, yeah. So they, they spent a lot of time with her and Shelly's been actively pursuing transcripts of the conversation, be it a recording yes. or even the police report and have yet to get anything because I, I think what she had told me was uh, if it became a criminal investigation, having released that could be a problem. That actually stood out a lot to me because there's, there, there are things that we were um, thinking about a lot and talking about a lot with the, uh, with the Mora case. You know, why aren't they giving the family information? Why aren't they doing that? And I wouldn't have put things together like I did uh, until I listened to your interview when she said if it goes to a criminal, if there's if there's a criminal element to it and it, and it goes to trial, what they've given to me is completely inadmissible now and right. they don't have a case. And that's like, wow, what a kick in the nuts, right? What what I kind of thought of when I listening to this point, of it, I was thinking with the case that you're covering with Maura Murray's disappearance, there's the video, the ATM video. Is this not the, you know, the equivalent of that? But I just feel like the mother should be able to, I, I just feel like if something happened to my child, I should be have access to everything. And I don't see why Shelly can't, but I guess it's on the outside looking in and not knowing what could go wrong. The police probably have dealt with cases where things have fallen apart because they showed compassion to the family. But I just feel like um, Shelly should know what happened. They they should really at least show Shelly the transcripts. Absolutely. But if, it, if, it's, if it's not... But she didn't do anything. She's not a suspect. Not, but the lawyer can say, if anyone in the case, if it goes criminal, they can say, you didn't keep this information confidential. It's now not even admissible in court. Mm, God, Done. I don't know. Yeah. Done. But there's probably nothing in there anyway, unless she said somebody's name. And I can't imagine they'd have a transcript. Like, if the police... Yeah, that's a good point. How, how often must they get a call where somebody's acting uh, unusual downtown? I can't imagine they record or write the whole, you know, all the dialogue down. I would... My guess is there's probably, like, a, you know, a couple paragraphs of, of what happened, but... Right. Either way, it's just the fact that it, there's the mystery of what's in the report. Like I can imagine how I can't imagine how Shelley must feel knowing that there's a, a file somewhere in the police station with that written on it, not being able to go in there. I would, I think I'd want to go down there with a baseball bat and make my way in. Um, when when I was listening to that part, I was thinking, man, I hope this doesn't turn into twelve years later. And yeah. everyone is yeah. screaming about, well, why didn't you give this information? And all of these details are getting lost. You know, people should really pay attention to your podcast with this right now because this is pretty close to, um, you know, we're talking like three, four years later. It's pretty close to the actual disappearance. You're talking actually to the family members about it. And you're not trying to uh, scramble and gather information and dig through a bunch of like, you know, muck to get to, to get some progress. I think that what what the case is suffering from now is just the exposure. So I'm I hope that people listening to this show will you know let Shelley know that they're that they care and that they're interested and you know and tell people about it and just just get Emma's face and the word out there because it's hope isn't lost at this point. If if Emma is living a transient life somewhere in Canada or the U.S. or wherever she is, you know. It, it's that's still very much possible in in the short amount of time and th that leads me to the next thing and i found when i spoke to to shelly i had asked her in your search for your daughter what comes next and i don't know about you but i found it absolutely heartbreaking to hear her say she doesn't know what she's going to do next and she's you know feels like she's at a brick wall i really thought she was going to respond with a breakdown like a game plan of what comes next and she she said she'd there's no idea. Yeah, it's very, it's very heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. To hear her put it in words was intense. And when you when you think about um, things in your life that don't really matter, let's say work or, you know, let's just say work and you're, you know, you have a deadline and you're trying to work towards something and you're at your wits end. It feels pretty horrible, but you get by it. But to hear someone say that when it's when it's their daughter, like that is just heartbreaking. She has nothing. She has nothing to to firmly put her put her put her mind and her hands around and say this is this is going to be where I'm going to go next. She has the the Facebook and she has all of the media outlets that will listen. But you Some, know, she she said even though she's grateful that she gets emails and messages that they saw her six months, eight months, a year ago, as much as she appreciates that, by that time, what's what does it matter? I can't imagine that. Someone needs to shake the apple tree, Lance. 
Jordan, you might be the person to do it. I wish Lance and I could be the per the people to do it. If we had funding and we were finished with uh, the Mara Mari documentary, I think that this would be a very uh, a, a wonderful case to dive into and try to help because it is it, so fresh. It is so fresh, and it seems like there should be more answers. Um, the police that night, to me, seemed like they believed her story based on what I heard in the documentary. It seemed like she was coherent enough, and they didn't believe she was a danger to herself. So if we're to believe she killed herself just after that, where's her body? I don't, I don't know. It, I feel like it would have turned up. I could see her having left Victoria, because Victoria, I've actually been to Victoria and Van Vancouver. Victoria is very small. I can't imagine there are too many people running around homeless, um, uh, shoeless in November in Victoria. I'm sure there's a number, but not a huge number. But Vancouver has a lot of homeless people. So I could see her having escaped to a, some kind of transient lifestyle in Vancouver, but a psychotic break or a manic episode does not last for four years. It would have ended at some point. She would have contacted somebody. That's my thought with, with whether or not there's the transient life is that the details of the case that would lean towards that is the mental illness, the her lifestyle before her disappearance. She was staying with a friend on a boat in a woman's shelter. She was maybe staying at a treehouse for a period of time. So there was some aspects of her life that were pointing in that direction. But the fact that it's been going on for this long without her being arrested or having to go to a hospital and being identified that way, or just, you know, snapping out of it somehow and contacting someone. I don't know. It's, it's, it seems odd. I can't imagine that that's it, but I'm sure it happens and people, you know, lose a family member for longer than four years and they eventually, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's totally accurate that a, a psychotic break doesn't last a certain amount of time if she's not taking medication and it and if you're actually looking at the uh and reading the diary entries it her paranoia is is growing and growing and growing and if you're not taking medication and you're not taking care of it and you're living on the streets in a transient life it's getting worse and it'll it's not like it'll just go away it's not like oh uh, you know one day it's starting to get a little better well, I think no, you're, it depends you're on, on the, the illness. But, and it depends on your environment, too. If you're living a transient lifestyle and you're in the street and you're looking and in every shadow that you see might be somebody looking back at you, like that is not helping your illness. It's not like you you're know? not going to snap out of it. I'm not going to say that like a cartoon or something like that. But if she was bipolar, for example, she would have the, – the manic episode would have ended. Didn't, didn't, didn't read like bipolar, though, it did it? Didn't it, to me either, but and that's it read like Shelley. paranoia. Shelly believes it was some kind of mental illness. Did did she go into exactly what illness she thought, Jordan? No, and she see, she did say potentially schizophrenia or some type of mental break. But when when I spoke to Shelly on my the first episode I did about it, she described reading through Emma's journals, and Emma was referencing things from her earlier in her life and from her childhood that led Shelly to believe that her struggle with mental illness has been going on for a long time. She was said uh, in her teenage years to go for abnormally long walks where she would go on her own and just walk and walk and walk. And I guess that's, I, I don't, again, I don't know anything about this, but that's Manic walks. Yeah. yeah. Like that sort of thing. So maybe it's something that's been building up for a long time and it just on on that day in November when she disappeared was just the day that it, you know, hit its fever pitch. That is the age that, that bipolar shows itself. That, and, and that's, I think, why I lean towards uh, or, or is why I, I assumed bipolar. Maybe I, I'm probably wrong in assuming it, but yeah, 24 or something like that. Uh, right around that age is is when it usually shows itself uh, in, an, in a major way. One other thing. So we, we talked about the op the possibility that she could be living a transient life. Getting back to abduction, one thing we didn't talk about, we, we mentioned Julian, but we didn't talk about the poster guy. I think I forget what the there's different names for him. I've always called him the poster guy, but that was the guy in Vancouver who went into the he, he pulled a missing persons poster off the front of the store and went in the store and complained to the clerk working there, basically saying this isn't a missing person. It's my girlfriend and she doesn't want to be found. This is a guy in Vancouver. They've there's stills of him from the from the security camera in that store and they're all over the internet and they were shown in the CBC documentary that y y we talked about finding Emma but th that to me is I don't know if that's a red herring or what but that's uh, an odd situation yeah when I first saw that I was uh wow that that's such a that there, there's a break right there right and then 
no one would do that if they in in that situation no one no one would do that no one would go in and and the store owner notices that you're irritated and he's touching clothing and by the way they i don't know if they can pull fingerprints off that or if they tried to pull fingerprints off everything he touched in the store but he's 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 like just barely looking at the clothes and he's like you know kind of throwing things down he's like obviously trying to look irritated and and then i mean Maybe it was uh, maybe it's just some dude looking for attention, but they were they were never able to find out who it was later, right? They've never found him, and they've police said they've they've wanted to speak to this guy, obviously, but yeah, I guess if if that if that was what was actually happening, why would he go in the store and do that? Especially if those posters exactly. were all over town, he'd be fighting an army of people, right? Yeah. And what's what's the use of taking one of those posters down and wobbing it up in your hand and walking into a store? And being like, don't mind me, I'm irritated because this is my girlfriend and and she just doesn't want to be found, you know, general store owner yeah. who I don't know. It definitely seemed like a red herring to me right off the bat yeah. as well. Um, but it's interesting that that guy hasn't turned up and Emma hasn't turned up. Um, like if but- like he's probably a drug addict living a transient lifestyle and he hasn't shown up and I'm not sure exactly when that that video footage uh, came out, but you know, he hasn't been found in that time. So maybe there's a chance that Emma could be living a lifestyle similar to that and could have been uh, her, you know, his, his girlfriend. It, but, but it's, I think very, very unlikely. It, it definitely read like he was just on drugs and, uh, that dude, little, it actually yeah. it actually read to me like maybe a group of his friends were out there and was told him to pull a prank on the store owner. Yeah, um, maybe Guy is just an asshole, and that's probably most likely. Honestly, when I was looking at it after, you know, after, because at first, like, with every one of these types of missing person cases, you see something like that, and you lock in, and you're, oh, that's a clue. And maybe it is because we've been doing this with the Moore Murray case. I thought that for maybe 20 seconds, and then I was like, no, that guy's an asshole. Yeah, but at the same time, he, you know, they should still keep looking for the guy. Oh, because, I think they are. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. definitely need to get his story. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. I would. I mean, this is just like yeah. us talking about right. this guy being an asshole. If I was a police officer, I would hope that I would say, "Yeah, he's an asshole," but I'm going to find out and make sure that he's an asshole and doesn't know where she is. Yeah, yeah. and again, for Shelley to have that needing to be crossed off the list. Exactly. Um, absolutely. You've both done such an incredible job stimulating activity in Maura Murray's case. Do you have any advice for people searching for Emma and the people working with Shelly? I think the only bit of advice that I would have is to not pigeonhole yourself into one particular theory and and fight hard for that to be true. One of, uh, one of our listeners who is a police officer said you have to approach any criminal investigation as a mansion with a lot of doors and you have to look inside every single one of those doors and don't close them until you know that uh, you can rule that out. So open-mindedness, for example, we just talked about that gentleman who went into the store with the wobbed up poster. Know that there are assholes out there and know that there, you know, that could be an actual lead, but follow it up until it eliminate things until the only thing left left is something you can't eliminate. I, I think the first thing to do would really be to publicize it as much as you possibly can. Shake the tree. That's what we've been doing and, and seeing the progress. Um, seeing the apples fall. A, a will lead to B, um, <clears throat> usually in unexpected ways, though. I would also say this guy, Julian. Yeah, maybe, maybe, like... I can't imagine he doesn't have a police record. If you're still with me, thank you for joining Tim, Lance, and I on our journey deeper into the disappearance of Emma Filipov. I don't see this episode as having advanced the story in any meaningful way, However, I do feel that by discussing the case casually and by having someone to help unpack my conversation with Shelley, I've been able to put the story's many moving parts into better context. But it's all still shrouded in mystery. What was happening in Emma's life before her disappearance? Was she facing a mental health crisis or a real threat? Who was the green shirt guy? And what's up with Julian? And most importantly, where is Emma Filipov? 
Now these big questions still remain, but we're about to begin receiving new information that will help us in answering them. I'll start in the next episode of this series. As it turns out, during the production of this episode, I reached out to Julian many times and in a variety of ways. With his name mentioned both by Shelley in part one and brought up during my conversation with Tim and Lance in this episode, I wanted to offer him the opportunity to share his side of the story. And to my surprise, Julian accepted my offer. And what he told me left me with a lot to consider. And that's coming next. Not long after I sat down, she said, look at me in the eye, Julian, and, and, and tell me that you didn't follow him all the way, all the way here to Victoria. She said, my, she said, Emma's father just, just found out about this, uh, about this Facebook message that you, you sent him. And, and yeah, that was just a hard, that was just a, a hard moment there because I felt it was shocking and hurting. And even though it, it made sense for her to ask me that, uh, I knew what the truth was and it was still, it was still hard to, it was still hard to accept. And with that, we'll conclude this episode of the nighttime series Emma Filipov is missing. Now, before we wrap things up, I want to end with some thanks. A massive thank you goes out to Shelley Filipov for again taking the time to speak so openly with me. Shelley, I trust you and believe your explanation concerning the charges against you. I look forward to this horrible legal situation making its way in and out of a courtroom. I only hope the truth comes out completely. Next, I'd like to thank Tim and Lance of Missing Maura Murray and the Crawl Space Podcast. I've added links to both of their shows in my episode notes, and I encourage any of you listening to check them out. It's great stuff. I'd also like to thank CBC's Mark Kelly and the team that created the Finding Emma documentary. For any of you who haven't seen it, I've added a link to where you can watch it, as well as links to several other sites related to this episode in the show notes. Next, a big thank you to Vox Somnia and Paragon Cause for providing the musical and ambient themes for this series. And lastly, the biggest thanks of all goes out to everyone listening, as without you all, the sun would have rose and set on nighttime years ago. For any of you out there who want more nighttime, please consider supporting my Patreon campaign, where for a dollar, you can access the ad-free premium feed, which provides early releases of the episodes. And then, for only a couple dollars more, you can access the Nightcap After Show episodes in which I and a guest climb even further down the rabbit holes than what you'll hear in the main episodes. You can join my Patreon and access the supporter content by visiting patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a big hand by telling your friends about me and leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Equivalent. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities on and off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where I'm using the handle at NighttimePod. If you have any story ideas or would like to give feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. Now, until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and contact me on social media to give me your theory on Emma Filipov's disappearance. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte. Somebody somewhere knows something. She didn't just disappear. She couldn't just vanish. Somebody has to know something, Jordan. Somebody has to know something. <laughs>